He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us.
suffer the death on the cross for our redemption. And by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Lord, make us to die every day to sin so that we may live with you forever in the joy of the resurrection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered a curse. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord. They and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox but dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. The psalm reading today is found on page 272 in the worship book. Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, You are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. Their libations of blood I will not offer, nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have no heritage. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I accept the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not fall. My heart, therefore, is glad and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your holy ones see the dead. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second lesson today is a reading from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, 19 through 26. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
Here ends the reading of the lessons. Please rise for the gospel. Is that the tomb is empty. 
If it were not for the goodness of Joseph and Arimathea, Jesus would not even have had a place to be buried. However, just a few previous verses from our gospel text today in John, the gospel of John chapter 19, in verses 38 through 39, Nicodemus and Joseph had gone to Pontius Pilate and requested that the body of Jesus be released into their care for burial. Now, Pilate was surprised that Jesus was already dead, yet he granted their request. Now, it was about this time that the Jewish leaders had want, who had wanted Jesus killed grew concerned that this tomb may actually become empty. And so in Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 through 66, Scripture tells us, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he had been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. <clears throat> Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. <clears throat> Jesus' enemies at least seemed to remember that Jesus had said that he would rise from the dead after the third day. So guards were posted to make sure that no one stole the body of Jesus. Verse 66 even mentions that a seal was also placed on the stone to keep the tomb secure. And yet, and yet, even with these precautions taken by his enemies, the tomb in which they had laid the body of Jesus on that Friday evening still becomes empty on Easter morning. What is also interesting is that the tomb is empty contrary to even the expectations of Jesus' friends. There were a variety of reactions among the friends and followers of Jesus to the news of his death. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped the body in linens, and placed the body in the tomb. Luke chapter 23, verse 55, tells us that some women witnessed Jesus being placed in the tomb by Joseph and Nicodemus. Then they went home to prepare some spices and perfumes which would be part of the Jewish ritual burial. The men and women who witnessed Jesus' death all believed. They all believed that the death of Jesus was final. So now we come to that first Easter morning, and verse 1 from our text says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Verse 2 then tells us that Mary ran straight to Peter and John and told them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. <coughs> Peter and John then immediately both run to the tomb and confirm that, indeed, the tomb was empty. This brings us to our second indisputable fact, and that is, Jesus has risen. The tomb really is empty. <coughs> Even the critics do not deny that the tomb is empty, only why it is empty. The disciples could not have stolen Jesus' body. <coughs> Remember that the tomb had been sealed in guards and been placed at the entrance. These fishermen were not about to go after armed and highly trained Roman guards. The other thing to remember is that the disciples were just as surprised at the tomb being empty as Mary was. Which brings up an important point. If the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus, then they would have known that his resurrection did not really happen. And if their resurrection 
had not really happened, would all of those disciples have been so willing to proclaim that publicly? Would they truly have proclaimed a lie to the point that many of the disciples died horrible deaths because of it? No. The disciples suffered beatings, humiliation, and even death proclaiming those incredible words that Jesus has risen. Lee Strobel writes this in his book, The Case for Easter. They were willing to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming that he was risen without any payoff from a human point of view. They faced a life of hardship. They often went without food, were ridiculed, beaten, and imprisoned. And finally, most of them were executed in torturous ways. For what? For good intentions? No. No. Because they were convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that they had seen Jesus Christ alive from the dead. Two indisputable facts. The tomb is empty and Jesus has risen. Now with these two indisputable facts, we're going to now take a look at two imperative commands that were given from the angel at the tomb. The women who, who come to the tomb with the expectation of caring for the body of Jesus are met by an angelic messenger with a very specific invitation. The first command is to come and see. In the second part of verse 6, in Matthew chapter 28, an angel says to the woman who are there to prepare Jesus' body, come and see the place where he lay. The angel invites the women to come and see that they might compare what they have heard in the first part of verse 6. And the angel says, he is not here. He has risen, just as he said. The women now saw the indisputable facts with their own eyes. This then brings us to the second imperative command, which is, go and tell. The angel next commands in Matthew chapter 28, verse 7, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. The temptation, of course, in having witnessed such a divine event is to stay and linger in it. Whenever we experience a spiritual high point, we would just like to remain there and continue to experience it. And we still experience that same temptation today when we enjoy a particularly moving worship service. However, that's not where Jesus wants us to stay. Tony Evans, great preacher, love the man, at the Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship Church in Dallas, Texas, gives a great illustration about the purpose of the church and refers it in a format of which, he's, which he can do since he's the chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys. Here's what he says. In football, they have a huddle. The goal of the huddle is to give you 30 seconds to call a play. That is why they give you a huddle. At a professional football game, there may be 60,000 people watching you huddle, and they don't mind you taking 30 seconds to call the play. They understand that you have to get organized, that the players huddled together have to know where the receivers are going to go, the quarterback needs to know where he's going to go, and the running backs need to know where they're going to go, and the blockers need to know who they're going to block. A huddle is a necessary part of the game. But let me inform you that 60,000 people do not pay $80 a ticket to watch you follow. They want to see if their team can overcome the opposition who is daring them to snap the ball and move the ball down the field to score. What the fans want to know is, does your huddle work? <coughs> Dr. Evans goes on to say, now what Christians often do is get high on their huddles. We gather together on Sunday morning and we go nuts over the huddle. We say, boy, did we have a great huddle. 
And boy, do we go off on that hook. But what people don't seem to understand is, is that the huddle is so that we can play the game. The effectiveness of your church cannot be measured by how well you huddle on Sunday morning. The test of the church is what it does out on the playing field of the world. So what we need today is churches that are representative of Jesus Christ, not only when gathered on a Sunday huddle, but when they're doing, out doing what they decided to do in the huddle out on the playing field outside the church doors. Amen to that. Just as those first witnesses were commissioned to go and tell, we also are commissioned to go and tell what we have experienced with Jesus. Later, when Peter and John were commanded by the Sanhedrin, which was the supreme religious court of the land, to speak no more in the name of Jesus, they state this in Acts chapter 4, verse 20. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. When Paul was commissioned by God through Ananias in Acts chapter 21, verse 15, he said this, you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. We too are given a mandate to tell of what we have seen, heard, and experienced of the power of God in our lives. Jesus tells the disciples and us in the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus has promised his presence with us as we go. While Jesus has given all his disciples an extraordinary task of taking the message of the gospel to the world, he does so with the promise of his continual presence and comfort. These are the two imperative commands. Come and see and go and tell. So we have two indisputable facts, two imperative commands, which then brings us to one inescapable conclusion. In the case of Jesus, the issue is not the absence of the body. An empty tomb does not in and of itself make a resurrection. And it was not just that he was nowhere to be found. The issue is that he was seen alive by many people in many different places. The Apostle Paul tells us in the first book of Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 3 through 6, For what I have received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. The Apostle Paul personally knew some of the people who had seen the resurrected Jesus and could verify <coughs> that the resurrection was true. The point I want to make, folks, is that the disciples did not really believe in the resurrection. They knew they knew it as a historical fact because they had seen Jesus themselves. So we see that there are two indisputable facts. The tomb is empty and Jesus has risen. Along with the disciples, we have also received two imperative commands. Come and see and go and tell. Which then leaves us with one inescapable conclusion. The resurrection proves all that needs to be proven about the message of Christianity. And as soon as we reach that verdict, we then must wrestle with the implications. 
Jesus overcame the grave, and he is alive. Because of this truth, through his Holy Spirit, it is possible for you and I to have a personal encounter with him today. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? When Jesus called Mary's name to her in our gospel text for today, in verse 16, she immediately recognized him. Jesus is calling your name right here and right now. Will you recognize him also? Jesus reaching out to you with his nail-scarred hands and asking you to listen to him. Will you hear him? Will you listen to him? Will you answer him? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we celebrate this Easter where we once again rejoice in these angelic words. He is not here. He has risen. Thank you, Lord, for that incredible promise that if we only believe in that gracious and sacrificial gift of love, when your Son willingly died on the cross for our sins, that we have the forgiveness of all of our sins and the promise of resurrected bodies and eternal life with you in heaven. Thank you, Lord. And it is in the holy name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is Thine is the Glory in the green hymnal number 145. <laughs>
I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered in the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people, according to their needs. Father God, we thank you for this ability to worship you on Sunday morning. We thank you and we praise the resurrection of your son, Jesus, and we can proclaim he has risen. He has risen indeed. Thank you, Lord, for that promise that he is with us always. Lord, give us strength to stand on that truth as a church, that Easter is about your son, Jesus, rising from the dead. It's not about colored eggs. It's not about chocolate bunnies. Lord, it's about your son rising from the dead the dead, to give us that promise of eternal life and forgiveness of our sins. Lord, help us to stand strong upon that as a church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those churches who are, are trying to stand upon the truth at this time. Lord, give strength to the congregations, the church leaders, and the pastors. Lord, to be able to stand upon that truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for all those people who are ill in health at this time, whether that be in your spirit, Lord, we just ask your healing spirit to descend down upon us for all of those who are upon our hearts who are in need of your healing touch. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for all those missionaries who are fighting on the front lines to bring the truth of your gospel, Lord. Protect them, Father. Protect their health. Protect them from the healing of the supernatural evil, Lord. And provide them with the resources they need to do the ministries you have called them to. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we pray for this nation. We pray that we turn back to you, Lord. You are the truth. You are the way. You are the life, Lord. Let us remember that as a nation. As our forefathers who started this nation, let us stand upon that truth. That it is you we trust in, and we are still one nation under God. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, we pray for all of our brothers and sisters, family members, and friends who are fighting for that freedom overseas, Lord. Protect them, Lord. Protect them from any danger, Lord, and bring them all home safely to be reunited with their families. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Was anyone, was any specific prayers that they were going to make at this time? Please go ahead and say it.
safe travel for everyone who is going out to visit family members today. Lord, we thank you for safe travel for, for Elaine and Bob coming back, Janet and Clarence, and for John and Vicki. Lord, we thank you that they're, they're home back with us again safely. And we pray for safe travel for everyone throughout the state and weekend. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen.
Merciful Father, we all offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your grace as well. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
return to your seat. All who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Well, Jesus Savior. Come. This table is ready.
Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.